every aspect of what we choose to do, who we think we are in alignment with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, understanding that the Trinity calls us into relationship with them. And they define us, not the arts. They define us. If we are defined by that, then goodness will go before us and God will be our rear guard. Okay. Oh, and just quickly, quickly, quickly. Um, I want to tell you all that your midterm proposals were fabulous. I'm very excited about that. Presentations are November 11th in two weeks at the next Zoom meeting. And a four-page applications paper is due midnight, November 25th. That is on your syllabus, and it's on the lesson page for this week. So don't forget that. And your individual project proposals, which is basically your final project for the end, this is the end, due the end of December, those proposals are um, due this Sunday, November 4th. And that is just to get you thinking about it. These can be preliminary proposals. If you want to develop them further or even change them, that's okay. Let's just get it. Let's just get the ball rolling and think about it. Because we're moving into the holidays. We have things happening. I have projects happening. And um, we don't want to get behind on some of these core aspects of the course. Any questions very quickly before we start? Okay, Brian, you want to intro yourself and then we'll pull up your visuals when you're ready. Okay, uh, I'll share a few minutes and then I'll, I'll ask you for the first slide. Um, so my first art class was when I was five years old and it was at a kitchen table in the Ozarks and my art teacher was born in 1900 and she taught me how to paint and draw. Um, uh, and then uh, in college, uh, I walked away from football and became a theater major, and then took opera, and then took studio art classes. So as I like to say, I crammed four years of college into seven, and took an insane number of arts classes, thinking, well, I'm never gonna do that again, so I might as well just go nuts while I'm here, and uh, had an incredible time. And then when I graduated, I thought, well, I'm never gonna use those, um, because I don't know how I'm gonna get paid for that, number one. And number two, um, with regards to the church, I thought, well, this is never going to work in the church. And I first learned that I could use art, especially visual art, in evangelism in the inner city when I was invited to do portraits of homeless guests at the oldest street mission in Chicago, the Olive Branch Mission. And that was a summer-long project in 1988. And it, it really opened my eyes to the power of visual art. And the, the idea of sitting down with a homeless person and doing their portrait, and then through my portrait, uh, if the person wanted to talk, I would slow down the drawing and then have a long conversation. So here's me, a white guy, walking into a homeless mission, talking to women, talking to people of color who've never seen me before, and within an hour, we're having these remarkable conversations. Uh, it was absolutely amazing, and I, I realized that I needed to get a closer look at people. So I would say, can you please close your eyes and then look to the left and then open your eyes again? And they would do that. And so here they are following direction from me as an artist because I, I gave the drawings away. Uh, so I learned um, several really important things that summer. I learned to ask permission. Don't move unless permission's given. Um, and to the power of intense face-to-face -face communication with people through the arts, and I learned to give my art away. Uh, so it was a remarkable experience for me. Um, and there's some great stories that uh, I've, I posted on Facebook, but I could also send to you if you're interested. Uh, so since that time, what happened? Um, I, I worked at a church whose pastor decided that we should use art, uh, number one, uh, to show Jesus to the people of the neighborhood, and then number two, he got out of the way. Remarkable gift, remarkable gift of permission. Very few pastors I've met have that gift of allowing creative people to do what God has called them to do. By the way, which is very biblical. I'm going to say that, very biblical. God told Moses, there are these two brothers filled with the Holy Spirit, Ahuliab and Ahitub, and they're supposed to do this and this and this and just do it as I've commanded you to. So in other words, Moses didn't build the tabernacle. All these other guys did. And Moses got out of the way. Amen. Amen. So my pastor was a biblical pastor in that regard. Um, crazy as that sounds. And so what happened? Uh, we started a summer camp for children 
Well, that made all the senior adults in the church really angry because they saw the kids having all this fun. So all these little old ladies surrounded me and threatened me. You have to give us a seniors art camp or we're going to hurt you. Like, ah, ah. So fine, seniors art camp. And then we started a concert series in the summer um, out in the bank parking lot across the street. And then we moved it to a, an elementary school down the street. Uh, so on government property, by the way, um, we were actually proclaiming the gospel through a series of concerts all summer. And one night it would be hip hop, then reggae, then rap, then blues, then jazz, then gospel and folk. Um, and that actually got National Endowment of the Arts funding. Um, so while the, uh, the NEA was being attacked by Senator Jesse Helms from North Carolina for funding uh, gay, pornographic, anti-Christian stuff, we were actually using NEA funding to actually promote the gospel openly. And they gave us more money when, than we asked for, uh, and they asked us to keep applying. So we kept doing that until the NEA was shut down by the senator. Uh, height of irony. Uh, we also did a ceramic studio uh, full on with uh, three kilns, wheels, uh, in the church, um, a graphic design studio. I had to give away the keys to my office to all these teenagers from around the city as they kicked me out of my office because we had a full-on graphic design studio, an art therapy class for homeless women, a painting and drawing class in Cook County Jail um, in the Division I Supermax uh, unit, a uh, hip-hop modern dance company, which is a big deal because this is a Southern Baptist church. Um, and, you know, dancing is legal because it leads to sex standing up. So, you know, you can't do that, right? So anyway, uh, it, was, it was shocking that people were visiting us, but that was normal for us. I mean, by that time, the church realized there's something remarkable going on here. Um, we started doing murals uh, over gang graffiti with gang permission. And that's what I'm going to talk about in just a minute. But we also started a sewing art class for homeless women. Uh, we, we took out all these scratched, really nasty old windows, and the senior adults created stained glass windows with paint, and then we put them back in. So they're like, do-it-yourself stained glass windows, telling the stories of the Bible throughout the church. Uh, and then language, language banners in the sanctuary. The, the church, when I was there, had worship in nine languages, different worship services. And so there was a gigantic banner in the sanctuary that was in English, and it was really beautiful, but it was horribly offensive to me because it didn't fit us. It didn't fit my neighborhood. My neighborhood was a place where if you burned all your bridges, this is where you'd wind up. So it was the, the place, the highest infection rate of AIDS, uh, of HIV. It was the leading neighborhood for people being arrested for prostitution. Uh, half the state's mentally ill were dumped in the neighborhood. And there were over 100 languages spoken within two square miles. So you can't have something in English and then say you're gonna proclaim the gospel in that context. So we, we gave that banner away to a beautiful church that wanted that, that really treasured that. And then um, my mother and I created these with uh, other banners that simply had the name of Jesus in the languages that we use for worship. So, uh, and it was a large arched, um, long uh, horizontal arch space in the sanctuary. And so because of the space, English was the smallest because that would fit on the smallest banner. And the largest amount of space was for the Cambodian congregation. So it was actually the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So we had it in Yamba and Tui and Korean and Chinese and Hebrew uh, and several native dialects because uh, there's, uh, it was the largest, Uptown was the largest urban uh, center for Native Americans when I was a kid. So uh, there's now 23 or 24 banners still in the sanctuary, they won't take them down, of the name of Jesus in all these different languages. Um, individual banner per language. So that was fantastic. Uh, that took five years to do, by the way. Um, we also started a monthly worship and fellowship uh, meal for artists to just get together, have supper, to pray with each other, and to fellowship together. So artists from all over the city of Chicago would come together, and we meet in different studios. Um, and then we wind up doing murals with homeless, with kids, uh, and with permission of gang members, and with our neighbors. So I'd like to talk about that for a second. So if you can pull up the first slide. Um, and that's, it should be bright red letters with white trim. Oh, there you go. Wow. Look at that technology. All right. So. This was done with gang permission over gang graffiti 
on uh, the intersection where there were two rival gangs that claimed the intersection. And so they would uh, run at one another with weapons. And for three years, I would step out, out in the middle of the fights. And they would stop fighting and they would turn around and look at me. And then I would hear this voice in my head saying, say something. And so I proclaimed the peace and stopped the fight and let, let the kids know, the guys know you're, you're free to go home. If you want me to call the police, I can have you arrested or, you know, I'll see you tomorrow. But your fight's over. And after a while, I, I realized, well, they, they're actually listening and they actually walked away. Um, and I'd see them again the next day. And this was day after day for years. Uh, they would try to kill each other. Right in front, I lived on the second floor right above this wall. So um, then at one time I had a, uh, I was writing my roommate and I sat down on the sidewalk and I just was writing a letter uh, to him. He had moved away to seminary and a, a young woman walked up and snatched my letter away and said, you taking our names? And I said, no, I'm just writing a letter. She goes, it looks like a letter. I said, well, it is, it's a letter. You're not writing our names. I don't know your name. How would I know your name? So she gave me your name and she said, I'm the vice president of the Latin Queens. So there's a girls gang, the Queens, that joins up with the Latin Kings. Uh, I think she was 14 years old. And uh, so I'm, there I am talking to the vice president of Latin Queens, and in our conversation, out popped the idea for a mural over their gang graffiti. And she asked me through that conversation if I was a cop, and I said, no, I'm not a cop. Um, she asked me a number of times, and I said, no, I work, I work at a church. She said, oh, you're a church guy. So I said, yeah, I'm a church guy. Uh, she didn't know the word Christian, so I wasn't going to push it. And she said, well, if the mural has something about Jesus, uh, I think we'll respect it. But I'll bring it up at the meeting, and then I'll get back to you. Like, you know, I'll have my people call your people. So after their meeting the next week, uh, there was a shooting out on the street. And so I ran into the shooting, and the shooting stopped. And then a couple of the guys were there, and they said, oh, you're the church guy. You're the artist? Yeah, yeah, we talked about your mural. Yeah, go for it. And I talked to all the guys in the street that I saw, and they said, yeah, go for it, go for it, as long as there's Jesus. So the, the Jesus section is not on here. It's to the left, and it had a big cross and said, trust Jesus, and then dot, dot, dot. Whoever um, comes to me, I will give him peace. And then this is the word peace. And I wanted you to see this one because this is in graffiti wild style. And for me... The, the power of the Pentecost is not that people are speaking in tongues per se. That's one miracle. The other miracle is that people understood in their own language that Jesus loves them. And uh, we finished this over the course of two days. By the way, in advance, I called the police and I said, we're going to do this. I talked to my owner of the building because I'm just renting. Uh, I talked to all my Christian friends and everyone had the same idea, the same response, which is I'm an idiot and I'm going to get killed and the mural's not going to survive. Uh, usually in that order. Um, and when I called the police, they hung up on me laughing twice. So uh, anyway, we started to do this and the police almost killed us. Not the gangs, the police. Whole nother story. Um, but um, we wound up getting it finished. And we, we, the entire time, my friend and I, who's um, a graffiti master, he won a National Endowment of the Arts grant for graffiti. Uh, he designed this section that says peace. Um, and he, he said, um, this is my first ever North side wall and the, the gangs out here are crazy. And, but then the cops came up and almost killed us. Uh, after all that happened and after the cops went away and they told all the guys in the station, every squad car from the local district came by our corner that day. The night before they could not find our corner and the, the entire building was covered with graffiti. But the next day, here they come, and they're all looking at it, jaw dropped. And then later on that afternoon, just as the sun going, goes down, there's a doorbell ringing, and I look out of the window, and the warlord from the Kings is motioning me to come downstairs. And there's like 50 guys around him. I'm thinking, okay, this is either very good or very bad. Uh, and I put my shoes on, I'm thinking, okay, well, Lord, here we go. Um, whatever happens, I'm, I'm in your hands. And I walk outside, and the, the, the warlord rushes up to me, and he says, it's beautiful. Can you tell us what it means? And so we walk around the corner and at, on the right hand side of this thing is a, a laundromat and the laundromat sees me and they know me. So like, wow, Brian's about to get killed by the Latin Kings. Let's watch. So the laundromat empties out 
And then there's a bar kitty corner on the other side of the intersection, and they all say, wow, Brian's surrounded by the kings. He's going to get killed. Let's watch. So the bar empties out, and then all this, all these um, other people who are just getting off the train because it's about work, you know, the end of the workday, they say, wow, Brian's surrounded by the kings. He's going to get killed. Let's watch. So the crowd keeps getting bigger and bigger. And then one of the kids says, 5050, and that means the gang, the, the police are coming. And then the warlord looks at me face to face and he puts his, his hand right in my face and he says, I'm with you, which is a contract, meaning anything happens to him happens to me. Anything happens to me happens to him. And he ordered his kids, no one moves. And so the cops drove in up on the sidewalk with the lights going and they all came out with their batons out and they were going to beat us to death and no one moved. And they didn't have their sirens on, but the lights. So the lights drew out all the yuppies that had just started to move in the neighborhood because they followed the police lights. So now the crowd's huge, huge. Um, and and the, the lieutenant says, who's in charge? And everyone looked at me. And so I shared the Bible that day with the entire neighborhood, including the Latin King Nation. Um, so yeah, I almost got killed, but not by the kings, but by the cops. Um, and this lasted for two years, and then we had to redo it. And I'll show you the one we did at the end of this uh, but this led to another one. So we can go to the next slide. Um, a local bank uh, asked me if I could do a mural that would stop graffiti. This is, the wall is about 120 feet long and about 40 feet tall at the top on the left. And then it, it goes down, there's a little gap there and it goes down to about um, 28 feet. Uh, so I'm six feet tall, six foot six. If I stand in front of this uh, mural, I come halfway up the shin of the man in the middle with the blue jeans and the white shirt. I come halfway up his shin, just to give you some context. Uh, the Bank of Chicago asked us to do this, to stop graffiti. They said, do a community message. And the neighborhood is so broken and there's so many families in chaos, we thought of the prodigal son. So this is the uptown version, the prodigal son. And the son has just left the pig pen on the right and he's coming home. So the pig pen is Homeless people passed out in the street, uh, gangs, drugs, porn shops, liquor stores, um, SRO hotels. It's a, it's a really, it was just a devastated community. And he's a, he's a teenager with the green shirt and the blue jeans coming towards the, the center character, which is the father. And then the party's already started. We could not put text on this wall. The bank would not allow that. So we had to show the entire prodigal in one, one picture and this was designed by me and a college student uh, from Wheaton. The professor said, by that time, I, I became well-known around Chicago for the arts. And uh, this professor said, Brian, I got a live one for you. I don't know what to do with him. Please just take him off my hands. He's driving me nuts. And so Michael said, I'd like to do art ministry. And so this was the art ministry that he and I came up with. He did a, a small um, mock-up after a, one conversation with about 10 artists. And then I, we all agreed that he would do the finished drawing. And then I pitched this to the bank board. And the bank board, which was full of Jewish people and Buddhists and secular people, said, well, that's an amazing story. And I read it to them from the Bible. And they all said, that's the most beautiful story I've ever heard ever. And of course, you should paint that. So, um, and I, I, they said, what's happening on the left-hand corner? You can see that someone's like basically being lifted up. And I said, well, it's a parable about heaven. So he's, he's being taken into heaven. And they said, great, no problem. This faced the main line, um, the red line uh, of the subway. There's an, a station. This is the view that you would get if you step off the train looking east. You would see this. And this is from the distance. So you would see the entire basically um, story of the prodigal. Um, we learned a lot on this wall. We learned that the brick, the mural will only stay as long as the brick stays. And this wall was in terrible shape. So we did this $100,000 mural. The bank gave us a couple thousand dollars. Uh, I raised money for the rest of it. Uh, about 15 of us wound up painting it uh, over the course of a summer. Um, so we learned a lot. We'd had, we brought scaffolding up on the roof. We had to, I raised money. Um, we had to talk about insurance. Uh, who likes heights? Uh, how, do you get the, how do you get the mural design on the wall? So we learned about a pounce pattern. All these things God provided just when we needed. Like a, a, a brilliant artist friend of mine called me and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm trying to figure out how to get a mural on a wall. He says, well, have you ever heard of a pounce pattern? I said, no. He said, that's how the Sistine Chapel ceiling was done. He says, boy, take out a pen and take notes. 
And he starts telling me what to do. And then at that time, I was actually meeting with a man who was in the billboard industry. And I explained this idea to him. He says, well, I know the, the CEO of the largest billboard company in the country. He's a good buddy. Let's have lunch with him. I'll, I'll set it up. So suddenly, I'm talking to the billboard company. And I explain the idea. And he says, well, do you have a design? And I hand it to him. He says, come back in a couple of weeks. I'll hand you the pounds pattern. Like just crazy, beautiful things that happen to make this, this work out. Um, another thing we learned, by the way, we thought a huge wall, we need huge brushes. Well, that meant you're carrying lots of heavy paint and none of the other artists work out in the gym like I do. So their arms got tired. So we're actually using quarter inch flat brushes, like what you would paint on for a 12 by 18 inch painting. That's what we're painting this huge wall with. <laughs> um, it was incredible. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Um, two blocks south of our church, there was a, a street ironically called Sunnyside. And at that point, it was the most dangerous street on the north side of Chicago. Massive shootouts between the cops and gangs, massive shootouts between gangs and other gangs, rival gangs. And on this wall, which is about 150 feet long, 18 feet tall, there were all these RIPs, meaning tombstones. So a gang member shot, and then the, the, the gang puts up a memorial on the wall where the kid was shot. And if you paint over a RIP, that's basically you telling the gang, kill me, just walk up and shoot me now. So by this time, I'd been working on a basketball league, bringing rival gangs together across gang turf lines for Bible study and basketball. So I knew all the gang members. So I just asked them, hey, we're doing this mural. What do you think? And I already had a, a team working with me, uh, high school kids that I invited from across the city uh, to work on this idea. So I was showing them ideas and they said, well, as long as it is Jesus, we're fine. As long as it is God, we're okay. Um, by the way, um, the, the, the kids that came together, were, there were nine kids on the design team and it just so happened three were white, three were Latino and three were black. And so when that happened, I said, okay, it's about racial unity in some way. You guys have to figure this out. And it took them nine months to design this. They, they, it was painful to watch, but like they wanted to give us back the design idea. There's another young man working with me and I said, nope, nope, it's on you. It's on you to design this. And it's, everyone's going to see it. So like the pressure was astonishing for these kids. But they came up with this design. So it's this first part here. This is the creation of creation. And it's all flowing out of logos. You can see it through the trees. Um, so we're teaching the neighbor Greek, right? Um, and, and so out of that was creation. And God said it was good. Let's go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> the next slide is the hand of God populating the earth. And to the left, you see that text, that's from Genesis, uh, fill the earth and subdue it, right? Uh, so God made a male and female and he blessed them uh, to be fruitful and fill the earth. So there it is, gigantic. Each one of those letters is at least a foot tall. And, and the kids designed the hand of God is black and white, like it's ethereal, like you could see forever. And once they got out on the wall, they realized that's too dark. Can we put color? And so while we're painting, the kids decided, you know, God made all of us because it's a really diverse group of kids and an incredibly diverse neighborhood. And they said, what if we just like rock out God's hand? I said, absolutely. Why not? That's a great way visually to show that God looks like us and we look like God. And so all those body colors like being like dropped across the, the globe, that was their idea to say, you know, he's populating all the world and that we all look like God. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. Uh, but God's perfect creation was destroyed by sin. So here's a medieval mace that's shattering the globe. And on the mace, you have lust, envy, racism, greed, hate, that those forces that drive us uh, to build walls and to attack each other, uh, to wage war, and, um, and it shatters God's perfect creation. Um, and if we'll go to the next slide, all those broken shards are put back into place through Jesus of all these different colors. And to the right of that is this passage, you know, there's no uh, Jew or Greek or slave or female or male or, fe uh, male or female. Uh, we are all one in Christ. Um, and again, really big text. So nine kids designed this and then about 250 wound up painting it. Uh, the insurance worked out and again, a total miracle. Anyone who touched a brush was immediately covered with insurance. Uh, so we had one set of scaffolding, which we're rolling back and forth along the wall here. Uh, and this was a summer long project. 
Um, and people would walk up to us while we we're painting and they'd say, what are you painting? And every time they asked, I happened to be standing right there. So I would wind up talking to them while I was painting. And because half of the people who were asking were, were actually either very violent or very drunk or mentally uh, disabled, all the other artists said, Brian, you're the person who talks to people. So I probably shared the gospel with about 300 so people through the course of the summer as they would say, what are you doing? We're painting Jesus. And uh, incredible conversations. Um, I invited my homeless art class to join us, a whole group of children that were walking back and forth from a, a, um, a childcare place. They all begged the teacher, can we, can we paint, can we paint? This is, by the way, on a resale shop. Um, and so I went into the resale shop and I said, a whole group of kids want to join us on the mural. And they said, take whatever shirts you need. So they all looked like little Peanuts characters because we had adult size shirts on them so they wouldn't destroy their clothing. <laughs> it was adorable. And they made a glorious mess and they had a fantastic time. Um, and they gave tours. I painted that. I painted that letter. I painted that letter. And the homeless woman like, I painted that person. Like in the figure, you know, all the figures below Jesus. Um, so the, those who were okay with heights would get up on the ladder or get up on the scaffold. Um, but this was done over gang graffiti with gang permission and then gang protection on the most dangerous street in this part of the city. And while we were actually priming the wall, there were shootings. And then once the drawing went on the wall, the shooting stopped. And then all the gang activity stopped once we, we had the dedication. So it actually changed the block because neighbors from the block said, can I join you? And I said, yes, absolutely. And then every Friday afternoon throughout the summer, I would, I would have um, a lunch brought in for people who were helping. And we'd have this amazing feast on the street and then go back to painting. Uh, and people, other artists would come and just sing and pray. Others would, you know, just walk around the neighborhood praying for our protection or praying to God we use the mural. It's still there. Uh, it still looks like this. Uh, the building has actually been purchased and it will probably get knocked down and the, the space will be made into condos. Um, but this was dedicated once, and then there was a, a, a group of people that were illegally given permission to paint over it. Oh, so actually they painted over this with really bad paint to do a have a safe sex mural. Thought of a gigantic condom uh, thing over this, it was amazing. Uh, and the paint started falling off the wall within a week because um, they're using really garbage paint. So the next summer, after lots of meetings with the city and with this other mural company, we scrubbed all that paint off and we redid it. And that one took even more people and even more money. Um, and we dedicated that after the 9-11 attack, as it turned out. So, uh, and the whole neighbor came out for that, which is amazing. Uh, I'll go to the next, the last one here. This is the follow-up of the peace mural. And uh, this is from Genesis when God says, my son, my son, your, your brother's blood cries out to me from the soil. Uh, and so it says, your brother's blood cries out to me with a large smoking handgun. Um, and I did this with another graffiti artist, a young, a young man from Jackson, Mississippi, who wanted to come and do graffiti for Jesus. And so he lived with me for the summer and we worked on this. Um, and the funny story about this is that uh, I told the police and then I called them and then I called them again and then I called them again. And they said, why do you keep calling us? And I said, well, you tried to kill us the last time. So I just want to make sure you're not going to kill us this time. Um, so they got real quiet and very serious. Um, and then Ben and I were out there painting, just getting started. And then the cops came up on the sidewalk, really slow, very cautious. And the captain gets out and he says, so you're the man that called me? Yes. So you did the first mural? Yes. You're doing the second mural? Yes. He says, well, what is it? Tell me about it. And I told him about it. He says, this should be on walls all over the city. This is beautiful. This is really beautiful. Um, but you know, that, that, that whole gun thing, that's, the gun is messed up. That doesn't look like a real gun. So he gave us some critique and he laughed and he said, well, I'll, I'll send everyone by to let them know no one's to touch that wall. So this time, no one tried to kill us. Uh, and while we were working, one rival gang comes up, the Black Aixer Disciples, and they say, your brother's bread. What's this about? So here's a Bible study about Cain and Abel and brothers killing each other with gang members on the street, and then after about an hour of watching us, they say, that's really beautiful, but that gun is messed up. I mean, you gotta fix that gun. Do you wanna show us? And you know, Ben, he's over there by the gun, so he's actually working on giving highlights, and they said, 
yeah, you got to fix that now. And Ben looks at me and said, Ben, do it, you know, or this would be some problems. So now Ben is basically trying not to crap in his shorts while doing the gun. I'm over at the left-hand side of the wall laughing at him. Um, and then they say, that's tight. Okay, we're going to respect that, meaning we're not going to touch that. And then about an hour later, here come the Latin Kings, the same thing, only I'm over by the gun. And they're like, your brother's butt, what's this about? There's another Bible study. And they're, they're like, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, we got to stop the fighting. We're, we're brothers. We need to stop the shooting. And then they say, but that gun, who did that gun? Are you kidding me? And like, they're jumping all over me now. Ben is all the way on the left doing some detail. And now he's laughing at me uh, as I'm being ordered around by the, the gangs. You know, everyone's an art critic, really. Um, and uh, this one lasted for another two years before a spray paint just gets tired and you have to scrub it down. So uh, the landlord finally just scrubbed the whole wall clean. But this stopped a shooting war uh, in my neighborhood, which led to another mural. Over the course of about 10 years, we did about 50 murals uh, in the neighborhood, in the building, at the church building, and then in other parts of the city. Um, so I'll stop right there. Maybe you have some questions. Um, I could take your questions. So, uh, first of all, that was amazing. Um, Thank you. I, I, um, so I just want to say that. Um, and, and second, can I share some of those stories and use some of those pictures? How would I go about doing that um, and respect your, um, your experience, your involvement in that what do you have a recommendation on how to how to do that because that we my church's neighborhood it's not in chicago but it it has more in common with that than it does with suburbia okay. and and uh and i think that's the direction the neighborhood's going so you know to me this is a little bit of prophecy a little bit of forward looking and it's a way to get ahead of the curve i think it also provides traction for some of the things that i want to share with the church trying to build a little bit of a biblical foundation. But um, so that's, that's one thing um, like a permission or how do I get the slip or what do I need to do? Uh, the second question is um, um, close to that. Do, do you have a presentation that already exists where, where you know, you've kind of packaged this and put it in a, uh, a jar, so to speak, to, um, to help um, churches, understand you know so i like I, when i try and tell somebody else's story i feel like we're all, we've already diminished it it just doesn't have the same lightning doesn't have the same crackle um and god's only like a third in it whereas he was in it all the way um from the original speaker so that's the second thing um and then third the pastor got out of the way <laughs> but how but can you talk a little bit about the dynamic you set up in the church, some of the processes you used to get the ball rolling on, on these great projects you talked about, some of whom were NEA funded? Uh, I mean, if he's a smart pastor, maybe he got out of the way because he didn't know what the heck to do. Uh, but you had some ideas or somebody had some ideas. So I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about what you did within the church to kind of catalyze um, movement. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, let me start with that one first, uh, working with the church and the church leaders especially. Uh, first off, uh, the pastor was led to the Lord by my dad. He used to babysit me when I was a little kid. So he's known me my entire life. That helped. It wasn't like I walked in off the street and I'm saying, hey, pastor, you should do this because I'm anointed. Like, who are you? Get out of my face, right? So that, that removed that dynamic because that happens. You get a really young, gifted person who's like, I got all these crazy ideas. You got to let me do it, pastor. And if you don't, if you have a pause, they're like, oh, forget you. And they walk away. That didn't happen. That wasn't a dynamic with me and Pastor Jim. But he knew me enough to trust me. And he said, the only caveat is it has to share the gospel. But I don't care what medium, I don't care how it comes out, I don't care what, what idiom, what technique, what type of art, I don't care. I don't even know, because he says, I can't even, you know, I, I flunked sandbox in grade school. I was terrible. I was a horrible student, and he was. Uh, brilliant pastor, though. 
And so he said, it's up to you. So he trusted me. Okay. So what I would do is when I would get a project idea, I would run it by him and the elders and I would explain to them, here's why. So for example, the first mural we did in our church was the flip side of the mural wall. Uh, I'm sorry, the banner wall in the sanctuary. There was a small half court gym um, in, on, on the other side of the sanctuary. And there was this wall, it was 40 feet wide, about 18 feet tall with a curve, a curve uh, arch, if you will, a slow curve arch. And the, the kids at the art camp, these are five to 15 year olds, they did a spray paint graffiti mural with a friend of mine who did the peace mural with me, the first mural that you saw. Uh, we did it out in the alley so that we wouldn't uh, kill the kids with uh, spray paint poisoning, right? Um, and they had little masks on and we put shirts on them or, or we actually punched holes through garbage bags, like kitchen, uh, mm -hmm. white kitchen garbage bags. It's perfect size for shorties. You just like punch a hole in the head and just slip it down over them and then pull their arms out the side and voila, they're not going to destroy their clothes. Because the first time we did it without any covering, because I thought the kids would actually bring their own, because we told them, you know, bring your own stuff. And the, the families are in chaos and maybe two kids did. So we destroyed some clothing. The mom goes berserk. So we learned right. by doing, right? So we right. learned by doing. Okay. And then, um, but the pastor would actually have a meeting with his elders and the elders would actually ask me and the pastor really good questions. Like, why are we doing this? What's the importance? Well, and like, so we did this spray paint graffiti mural and the, the elders could not understand it. They couldn't understand it. They couldn't read it. And I said, well, so my response was, do you have a relationship with Jesus? And they said, yes, of course. Okay. Well, think of all the people who are going to come to this church because they're going to hear on the street that there's this crazy, beautiful mural there and they actually speak this language. So they're actually going to read the gospel in their own language. Now, are we going to say no to them? And of course, this church already had worship in different languages. So that they get that immediately because this was a diverse group of elders. They were from Africa, Caribbean. There was a couple of white people. Otherwise, a very diverse group of people, men and women, by the way, um, who said, oh, that makes sense. And so they would actually watch, walk through the, the gym area to like go to the bathroom and there'd be all these people staring at the mural. And after a while, they learned how to read it. And so they're actually giving tours of the mural. The kids working on it gave tours of the mural. And then senior adults, you know, then that's when they demanded a mural, you know, a mural of their own and a camp of their own. But like, I also learned it created ownership in the building. Like, the amount of abuse went way down mm -hmm. because everyone had ownership in the building because we started doing murals all over the building with all these different groups that met in the building. And it was, so on a scale of one to 10 with 10 being perfect and one being zero, when we started these art projects in the building, the building was probably a minus 25. It was a disaster structurally. Everything, I mean, everything was just really ugly and horrible. And so part of the idea for the murals was just covering up really ugly walls because they were just killing yeah. And uh, so, and then the place became really beautiful. And so people are being surrounded by beauty and they're realizing this is actually speaking to people. Like, like the language, it just had the name of Jesus in black letters on a white background and then a, a primary or secondary color, larger background. So it was big banner, smaller banner, text. So they were all black letters on white. And then with different, it's all single colored, gigantic blue or gigantic green or gigantic yellow or red, whatever, all over the sanctuary. So it was like, it was equal in that regard. But all these languages, they're so beautiful. And I knew we hit something when, when the African folks in our congregation came in and they started dancing. Like literally, that's how they responded to the murals, the, the banners, they started dancing. Um, I was just weeping watching that. That was amazing. Um, so the elders caught on real quick. And then the kids and the, the homeless people and the seniors who were doing it, they, they walk around like experts. No, no, I did that. I, I, I did that. Let me explain it to you. And they actually, and they'd share the gospel while they were doing it. So after a while, it became normal for our church. Now, shame on me because these kids grew up thinking that's a normal church. And then their family moved to another city and now they're in trauma. Like, there's no art camp. There's no murals. This building is ugly. Ah, like, what do we do? So, so I ruined a whole group of kids, uh, sad to say. Um, but, and then, and then the church just said, well, how do we pay for this? And I say, well, this might cost this amount of money. And the elders would look at me like, well, you know, you ain't going to get that money. You understand? You ain't going to get a dime. So it's sort of God's will. Like it's the fleece. If you raise the money, you could do it. And people, the crazy thing, someone walked in the church one time during a, 
the art camp, the children's art camp actually ran the service. Like they did the sermon, they did all the, the music, they did the announcements, everything was done by five to nine year olds. It was unbelievable. It was like the finest service I'd ever seen. They were incredible. And prophetic and profound and wise and funny all at the same time. And uh, it was packed, packed house because all their parents were there as well. And there was a guy who was sitting in the corner that my dad said, hey, look, there's someone over there. My dad was there because his grandson, my nephew, was in the camp as well. And that person happened to be a wealthy person who his daughter was an artist. And they were sitting there just because it was Southern Baptist Church. They were just visiting Chicago from Texas. And this man talked to my dad. And my dad said, well, you know, my son directs this. Uh, you know, they're working on a mural. And my dad took him down the street around the corner to show him the prodigal mural that was in process on the bank building facing the subway. And this man said, how much does that cost? And my dad just said, I don't know, maybe $5,000 for supplies. So that man wrote me a $5,000 check every year for 10 years. After like, I talked, I said, hello, I got to go meet with the kids. No, no, you got so much on your hands. Thank you. And my dad gave him a tour of the building and they gave him a tour of the neighborhood and said, this is what my son is doing. And suddenly... God provides just, uh, I go to an art store and I have this crazy, actually really obnoxious t-shirt on. It's got this horrible thing, you know, Jesus being crucified. He died for you. And how dare you reject him? It was, but it was an art shirt for me. It was covered with paint. Right. But I was just thinking it was an art shirt. Not it was a Christian shirt. I'm going through this art supply store and this man walks up to me. I've, I'm now pushing three carts full of art supplies. And he says, all this for you. And I said, well, I'm, I've got different, different, programs. He goes, are you a Christian? I said, uh, yeah. And I looked down at my shirt. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just an art shirt. But I was so embarrassed. He's wearing a Cubs baseball cap. He pulls the cap off and he's wearing a yarmulke. And he says, my Rebbe says that the Bible forbids images. And you're actually doing these things. So I tell him what we're doing in our church. He goes, you're actually doing these things in your church? And he just starts weeping. And then he draws me in close. He goes, look, shh. I'm the assistant manager. You shop for your art supplies here. Do you understand? And if I'm not here, walk away. Come back and just ask for Tim. I'm Tim. And when you come here, I'm going to give you 60% off. Do you understand me? Tim's special price. Shh. Don't say a word. Just Tim's special price. Like, so God was working through a Jewish man who couldn't do his art, but he was, in a, he was the manager of an art store. Like, how does that, on what planet does that happen, right? So it's like that kind of stuff happening throughout every project, really. Um, so for me, it was sort of a, the way I describe it with my mother is I'm walking through the door as it's being opened. And as I'm walking down the hall, I'm looking behind me going, that was amazing. Look at, that was incredible. Like, look at all these things that just happened because there was no script. There was no book. There were no articles about this kind of stuff. So I was just walking through in faith, just saying this would be great. That, that leads me, by the way, up to the sharing of the story. I don't have a, a, a video uh, of this. I don't have a, a YouTube story uh, channel yet. Uh, I am writing them down. So, uh, and the stories have lots more side story to them because some of them, there's a lot of things going on. Uh, so I can easily send those to you by email with the, the still shot that you just saw. Um, and you're, you're, you're welcome to use those in your church to encourage your elders to think about the possibilities of what could happen in your space. So I could do that. Um, well, I, just, I just have to say, I, I don't want to hog all the time, but I, but I, so this is so exciting to me because th these are what I call God stories. And I, and I, at the end of the day, it's, it's really more about God than it is about anything else. And, it, and yeah. it's the very thing that I think a lot of churches don't have. They have other stories, but they don't have God stories. <laughs> people get into God stories and people want to be involved in God stories. You Amen. can't stop them from being involved. And they start yeah. talking about God stories to other people that they know. So I, I just, yeah. it's great. Thank you. Um, what, um, I, I'd be, I would happily, <laughs> I would happily take whatever you can send me. That would be amazing. And, and if I need to wait until something formal comes out, I, I respect that. Uh, well, well Brian, sorry, Brian. No, no, no problem. No problem. Um, I hear in that. Uh, if um, Marie wants to send me an email list, I can send them out to, to each of you if you want, or I could just send them to you. It's, it's no problem. Okay. Well, I want to respect your. At some point, at some point I'm going to, I, I'm posting these, by the way, on Facebook, as Maria knows. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's someone who's reading them who's a really gifted author and editor. And she finally said, is this going to be a book? And I said, I think it is. She goes, well, when you're ready to write a book, let me know and I'll edit. 
And then my dad is sending me all these different publishing companies, mm -hmm. but some of the language I use, and it's not my language, it's language from the street. Sure. Uh, that cannot be, in my view, that cannot be edited out. So that yeah. means, like, there's one story, my dad laughed, he's, he doesn't do Facebook, so I just send him by email, and he laughed at me, he says, you know, this rules out Moody Publishing, there's no way they're gonna publish that. <laughs> but then he says, but you're like Luke, you just documented what happened. I said, wow, that's really redemptive, I appreciate that, Dad. So, anyway, so, but Brian, they will get into a book. Go ahead. Have you tried Urban Loft Publishers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, they, they chased me. Um, here's the thing. I'm, they're going to, they're going to put the book into the hands of a very small select circle of the United States. Um, and, and that's, that's a group that needs to see these, but I think they, they also need to be seen by other folks. Like when I post on Facebook, my theater friends from Wake Forest that thought I was a crazy mm -hmm. wild man, now they're seeing the gospel and we have these incredible conversations. My artist friends in DC and New York, they see these. Um, as well as people that I met across Latin America. So I don't, I think there's a wider audience than what Urban Loft would do. Good question. You all were just about out of time, but let's, it, does anyone else have a question or a comment? It's wonderful. <laughs> this is great to hear about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Betty. Where, where are you located, by the way? To me? Yeah. Well, I'm in, in Gainesville, Georgia, but I'm I'm, I'm old. <laughs> I'm an older person. <laughs> I'm taking this course because I, I like to learn. Oh, outstanding. Well, so you know, the woman who designed the stained glass murals in our building, uh, she was 75 okay. when, when she, she worked with the Seniors Art Camp. Okay. And then all these murals, uh, were the stained glass windows were done by women who were between 70 and probably 90 years old. Right. Uh, all, the, all the teachers in the seniors art camp were senior adults. Okay. And, uh, okay. So my mother, and my mother said, you can stay at my house. And they had a pajama party every night. Uh, they, like at the art camp, they'd go home and take a nap. And then around supper time, they'd hit into full, full energy. And my dad would you know, pass out because he was so tired. And they'd stay up till like three in the morning, having a crazy good night. I found out a couple of years, we did this for like seven years. Okay. And, after about three years, I realized this was my mom, the highlight of my mom's year, was having all these beautiful artist friends of hers who were her age, and they would just go crazy, fun, like unbelievable. And when they would share their art gifts, we would invite them, like we had the art camp in a senior adult center, mm -hmm. and so people from the building would come downstairs, and other buildings would like just come across the street. Uh, the Uptown, had, at that time, the highest concentration of seniors in the city of Chicago. Okay. Tens of thousands. And these, these gifted artists would simply say, I've got the supplies, if you'd like to join me, I can, I, we can do some painting together. Or would you like to work on some weaving? Or would you like to work on this? And so I would organize the camp, I would get them there, they would stay with my folks, they would give me a supply list, I'd get the supplies, and then I'd make lunch, and I'd serve lunch, and then during lunch, one of the seniors would share his or her testimony, okay. and then everyone would go back to work on their art projects. It, it was glorious, I mean, it sounds like fun. <laughs> it was so much fun. My mom loved it. She thought it was amazing. Yeah, that sounds so, like fun. <laughs> so you're not too old is what I'm saying. Okay, and, thanks. And by, <laughs> and by the way, one of the murals, they, the first mural they did was with found objects that we pulled out of dumpsters behind ceramic shops and glass shops. So it was like and junk jewelry and stuff from people's homes. Uh, and it was about Sarah laughing because she's too old. Okay, okay. It was so one. beautiful. I've done some junk creatures. <laughs> I've done junk. I've even sold junk creatures. <laughs> no, that's great. That's beautiful. <laughs> Brian, your creativity is boundless, and the innovation that goes with it <clears throat> is so critical, and I, we applaud that. Uh, we do need to close, but one, one comment you made was about the warlord back to the very first slide uh -huh. with the really bright red writing on the wall which is imprinted on my mind now, and that he came to you and said, it's beautiful. That really marked my heart. We've been talking about beauty and the transformative power of beauty. And these, these gang members that have created their own kind of community who are desperately in need of beauty that were so affected by the creative process and the innovation and the message. 
I love that. And, and you have just, you've given us application to a lot of the ideology that we've been talking about. And so thank you. Amen. I, there was a study that came out that said that uh, gardens and murals in the cities reduce violence. And, and I look at the theological impact of that, which is God reveals himself through his creation. And everyone just calms down and chills out. And uh, <clears throat> that's actually a really profound uh, statement. Thank you so much for sharing that. There's the best mural, by the way, the best Christian-led mural group I know of. And, and she, you're not going to hear preaching about it because she now gets city and federal funding. But it started as an art class to keep people from uh, kids in Philadelphia that were arrested for graffiti. They, this, this woman who wanted to do an art class, she went to the judge and said, what are you doing with these kids? Well, they either have to do community service or go to jail. And she said, can you send them to my art class as community service? Long story short, they've done over 3,000 murals in the city of Philadelphia. And, and some of them are like a block long and four stories tall on all subjects, including, by the way, overt sharing the gospel, as well as history of Philadelphia, as well as honoring firemen and police workers, honoring, honoring famous sports heroes of the city, uh, honoring different neighborhoods, honoring black life, honoring immigrants. It's absolutely amazing stuff. Her name is uh, Jane Golden, and it's called the Mural Art Program, M-A-P. And their, their website is phenomenal. And people come from all over the world now to give her designs, hoping that she will choose them to do the next group, next murals with other kids and young adults from Philadelphia. Uh, so I read about that in a, I think it was a Smithsonian Magazine. And I thought, oh, that, we could do that in Chicago. Well, that's brilliant. Um, so uh, I, I think that uh, Jane's really hitting on something. And she's still there, by the way, still doing it. And she's a legend in Philadelphia because of it. And the work is amazing. So if you go to Mural Art Program, you'll get it. I have seen some of her murals, so <clears throat> I am a believer, definitely. <clears throat> Brian, thank you again. And, and sure. will you finish us up in prayer? You all, I will, if it's all right with you, I will send Brian your uh, email addresses. And so we can stay connected with him, if that looks good, if that sounds good. That's fine. Thanks, thanks everybody, for participating. And right. Brian, will you close us in prayer? Well, before I do that, I just want to say, Krista, stop dominating the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> it's really annoying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, shame, shame on you. Oh, I like, wait, wait a minute. What's on the top there? Uh-oh, uh-oh. Yes. Yes, a tail. Outstanding. Thank you so much. That made my day. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Okay, well, with that note, let's pray. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the gift of creativity, and we thank you for the gift of art. Thank you that you commanded us to do these things, uh, to honor you, not to honor ourselves, but to praise you and to worship you. Uh, so thank you for the gift that you give us in providing us help, uh, for giving us uh, safety, for allowing us, Lord, even uh, to meet with church leaders and to see uh, God's grace, open people who might be resistant or hesitant or even against using art. Allow us, Lord, to continue to be agents of peace and reconciliation and, and build bridges between those who just refuse to those who don't understand to those who really want to do it. I, I pray that uh, your, your hand would fall upon every church represented in this class um, and that you would be glorified and you'd be pleased and that we would be encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for offering me to, to come. It's just a delight. Oh, my pleasure. Ciao.